Good afternoon and welcome to this session evaluating the first two years of the Media Freedom Coalition. Before we get going, let me introduce myself. I'm Jodie Ginsberg. I'm the Chief Executive of Internews Europe. I want to take this opportunity to thank the Estonian government for hosting us here. I think for many of us, this is our first in-person meeting uh, as a media freedom community for several years, and it's fantastic to see so many old friends and new friends uh, actually in person. But I also want to take this opportunity to acknowledge those people who aren't here and can't be here. The people that we are representing and have the fortune to represent over the course of this conference are journalists and media organizations working in extraordinarily difficult and trying circumstances. Many of them facing daily threats, dangers, imprisonment, threats of death. And they don't have the fortune to be in this fantastic building having these conversations. And I want to pay tribute to them here. So, what is the Media Freedom Coalition? Well, it was formed with great fanfare in 2019 in London at the inaugural Global Media Freedom Conference. And it is a coalition of countries whose mission is to promote and protect media freedom worldwide. From a small group in 2019, it's now a coalition of 50 countries. But what has it achieved in the past two years? Well, a new report by academics from the universities of East Anglia, City University London, and the University of the Philippines considers that question. And having read the report, and you have copies of it in front of you, let me tell you, it doesn't pull any punches. The conclusion is that the Media Freedom Coalition made a good start, but it needs a reset. And it needs a reinjection of energy and funds to succeed. I have to say, after two years of, of living with a pandemic, I think that, that probably is something that resonates with all of us. Uh, and having read the report, I think it offers a really detailed insight into what the Media Freedom Coalition has done well and what more it can achieve. And, and I'm slightly disappointed that the ministers are meeting in a separate room next door. I think they should really be here to listen to it. So I'm hoping that those of you who are here will convey it back to your governments, because the conclusions and the discussions today, I think, are vital for ensuring that the Media Freedom Coalition achieves what it sets out to do. Let me tell you a little bit about the format for today. This afternoon, we have a fantastic set of panelists who are going to help us consider the media landscape and the Media Freedom Coalition's role in it. I'll introduce the panelists, and the, the, in, the panelists will introduce themselves, actually, in, in just a minute. The way it will work is this. We're going to, after the panelists' introductions, have an intervention from a variety of different speakers. We're going to group those interventions and responses thematically, picking out the themes that are considered in the report. Uh, and then there will be some concluding remarks from Ambassador Bahia Tazib, who is here from the new co-chair um, of the MFC, the Netherlands. So I'm going to now walk gracefully across the stage. It's, it's very difficult to do this when you've spent two years in basically pajamas. It's, it's quite stressful, actually. Um, so you'll have to excuse me. Um, and, I'm, and I'm seeing you all in sort of bubbles and imagining that you're on screens, because that's obviously what we've become used to. Panelists, let me just ask you to briefly introduce yourselves and your relationship to the Media Freedom Coalition. Mary. Hello, I'm Mary Myers, and I'm an external research, research associate at uh, the University of East Anglia in the UK. I'm the lead author of this report. Thank you. Oves. Uh, hi, my name is Oves Aslamali. I'm Secretary General of uh, Pakistan Press Foundation. Uh, I was elected as the co-chair of uh, Media Freedom Coalition's consultative network with the support of uh, GFMD. And uh, I uh, retired uh, yesterday. And uh, we have a new uh, co-chair, uh, also from South Asia. So really happy about that. 
Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jeff Martyr, and I am Executive Director of the Human Rights and Indigenous Affairs Policy Division at Global Affairs Canada, which is our fancy name for Canada's Foreign Ministry. And for the past year, I've been heading the team at, at the ministry uh, that leads on the Media Freedom Coalition, so uh, in a co-chair role, which will continue. Uh, it's been with the UK, and it will continue with the Netherlands for the year ahead. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, I'm Jan Yagintsu. I'm an international lawyer and barrister practicing in London. I was asked by uh, Lord David Newberger to succeed Amal Clooney as the deputy chair of the high-level panel of legal experts on media freedom. I can tell you happily that um, the person I'm serving with, Catherine Amifar, is currently addressing the ministers and probably um, uh, telling them the sorts of things that I might be saying here today. So you have a, a voice. Excellent. Yeah. That's good to hear. So the report that uh, you have the summary of in front of you picks out a number of themes and areas that the Media Freedom Coalition set itself essentially as targets. The first theme is promoting accountability in responding to media freedom violations. We want to think now about how the Media Freedom Coalition is responding to those violations. Is, it, is naming and shaming of countries working? And what should it do to respond to incidents of media freedom violations and address impunity? To kick us off in thinking about this, I'd like to invite Rebecca Vincent, Director of International Campaigns with, for Reporters Without Borders, RSF, to address us. Thank you, Jody, and thank you so much to the research team. We are so grateful for this work. Um, and just to be very clear, we did feed into the research as well. Um, I personally gave an interview, and I believe other colleagues spoke to the team as well. Um, I think it's very needed, and we, we broadly have come to the same conclusions within RSF. Um, Maybe I should preface this with RSF and the other members of the, civil, uh, of the consultative network, the other civil society organizations that have worked together on this. All of us want the MFC to succeed. We always have. We've all put in hundreds of hours of staff time uh, in good faith, really hoping that this coalition will do what it set out to do. And we still remain very hopeful that that will be the case. Um, this report can serve as a useful guideline in terms of identifying areas uh, where things have worked and where things haven't and, and how we can move forward together together more robustly, um, and especially on the side of the states involved, to hold themselves accountable and to hold each other accountable for their own media freedom performance as well. Um, just to make it clear, I'm not speaking on behalf of the CN. We're, we're very well represented by OAS here, and we've been grateful for his efforts as co-chair. Um, just speaking um, on behalf of RSF um, from our own experience within the consultative network, and also as a member of the external advisory committee of the high-level panel. Um, we've been very heavily involved in, in all of the various processes around this. Um, it's clear that some member states have approached their involvement in the MFC with the best of intentions. Um, some states have allocated significant time and resources into setting it up and making it work. Some states have enthusiastically initiated joint actions, supported joint statements, allocated funding to the Global Media Defense Fund, served as co-chairs or executive group members of the coalition, and hosted conferences like this one. Um, and, and some have taken great care to try to work to improve their media freedom performance and hold other states to account as well. However, as outlined in the report, it's clear that there's also some members of the MFC that have done none of the above or little of the above, some who have rarely supported joint actions or statements, some who have not allocated funding, and who are not really working to implement the recommendations of the excellent reports of the high-level panel or otherwise really take any concrete action to improve their own media freedom records or to hold each other to account. As the MFC grows, a key challenge will remain extending membership only to those states that truly share the MFC's values as outlined in the Media Freedom Pledge and the MFC's governing documents, and really come ready to do their part to improve media freedom domestically and internationally. This was the unique value that we saw in the formation of the MFC in the first place, and we sincerely hope that this focus and commitment is retained in the pursuit of an ever-expanding membership. I think it's important that it's an exclusive club, that it's not just broadened to, to include as many members as possible, but those who are really uh, ready to enact these commitments that they're taking on in, in their membership. It must be said that no state has a perfect record when it comes to media freedom. We can even find examples of violations in the countries at the very top of the World Press Freedom Index. 
That fact should be accepted as a baseline, meaning that all MFC states should acknowledge that they have room to improve, and particularly those who join the executive group. They should seek to lead by example. Um, we have been encouraged by the awareness of MFC states of their rankings on RSF's World Press Freedom Index, and indeed by the tremendous progress that has been made uh, by some members, as, rough, as you can see in the scoring and ranking from year to year. We hope that MFC states will begin to more robustly hold themselves and each other to account in areas of regression, and at RSF we stand ready to engage with states on these points. Um, we expect a lot from our democracies, and we expect a lot from MFC members in particular. Um, we could point to cases where the MFC has not done enough in our view or has not acted at all, and I don't want to go too in-depth into too many cases. Um, anybody on the, the consultative network can speak of the case referrals we've sent over, and we've seen the products of some of those in the report. It's, it's provided really useful data about who has signed what and what statements um, have had an impact. Um, but I feel obligated to raise one case in particular, which can too often feel like the un unacknowledged elephant in the room at such fora. Um, and that's because it involves two MFC uh, states, not just states, but members of the executive group. That's the case of WikiLeaks publisher Julian Assange. Again, we expect a lot from MFC states. We expect a lot from our democracies. As long as Julian Assange is detained and as long as the U.S. continues to pursue his extradition and prosecution uh, for publishing information in the public interest, this case will serve as a thorn in the side of both of those governments and the MFC. So we call on these states to lead by example, put a stop to this case, drop the charges, set him free, and then we can move on in holding all states accountable for their, for their media freedom commitments without this sort of um, undermining the ability of the states involved to do so on the global level. We could go through other areas of criticism uh, identified in the report, and if there's questions, I'm very happy to get into that in the discussion portion. But at RSF, we prefer to focus more on solutions for improvements going forward. At this point in the evolution of the Media Freedom Coalition, not only do we call on states to approach the MFC with a, rene uh, with a renewed vigor, but we challenge them to support more concrete solutions, such as those that my, myself and my colleagues from RSF have been presenting here and will continue to present over the, the course of this conference. This includes uh, in initiatives such as the Information and Democracy Initiative, the Journalism Trust Initiative, and the establishment of a UN Special Representative for the Safety of Journalists. These each respond to different areas of media freedom challenges, attacks on freedom of information, the spread of disinformation, the crisis of trust in media, and physical attacks on journalists themselves. But we believe these innovative solutions have the potential to be game changers in pursuit of our mutually shared goal of improving media freedom around the world. Please listen out for more information on these initiatives during tomorrow's pledging session and in the afternoon panels on disinformation and protection tomorrow, as well as a separate information session will run on the Journalism Trust Initiative. Um, but thanks again to the research team for this excellent report. Thanks, Rebecca. So Rebecca there set out some of the challenges of, uh, that have faced the Media Freedom Coalition. Mary, you are the lead author of the report. Perhaps you can just set out for us how you went about this report and then perhaps respond to some of those um, points that Rebecca raised, particularly around the, has it worked? You know, that the whole point of this thing was to raise big cases to international stage and put pressure on governments to, to make changes. And, and so I, I guess the question is, has, is it working? Thanks very much. And thanks to Rebecca for that really important reminder of the bad state of media freedom worldwide, even in the states that have been uh, um, convening the Media Freedom Coalition. Um, so, yes, myself and uh, five colleagues from uh, ac five academic colleagues from the University of East Anglia, City University of London, and the University of Philippines. Uh, in, uh, interviewed about 100 uh, journalists, media freedom activists, lawyers, media support NGOs and civil servants in the UK and elsewhere, and made detailed case studies in Sudan and the Philippines. And we're, I want to say, to really emphasize how independent we are, we basically, we went, uh, we marched up to Alistair King Smith, um, uh, one of the uh, initial civil servants, uh, uh, initiating the um, freedom campaign in, from the UK side uh, at the London conference in 2019 and went, we'd like to evaluate you. Uh, how do you feel about that? And uh, to his credit and to the credit of the Canadian team as well, they've been very open to our analysis and um, probing questions. 
Uh, so, as you can see on, our, on your sheets, um, on this um, summary, uh, we've said reset required question mark because this whole po the point of this session is a debate about that, but basically we do think that that is needed. And we've assessed and awarded a m a marks on the back, um, which are not terribly good. Basically, the, our score is could do better. The color-coded scoring we've given uh, is an amber red overall, which means unsatisfactory achievement in most areas with some positive elements. So yes, there have been some positive elements. The consensus from all our interviews was that the Media Freedom Coalition has taken some positive steps. It was ambitious and it was a laudable initiative, that's very true, and it fills a gap in international provision that the UN doesn't really do. Uh, 50 members is somewhat of an achievement. Um, and so is the co collegiate way of working that has been established. Uh, the structure of the 50 states being advised by the consultative network uh, and the high-level legal panel is a very good one. And of course, there's the monetary pot, the financial side, which is uh, convened and coordinated by, the U by UNESCO, which is the Global Media Defense Fund. So yes, early successes. Some states, for example, the Maldives and Sierra Leone, have seen some positive improvements in their domestic laws by virtue of being part of the coalition. Um, there have also been examples of some positive pri pri private diplomacy behind closed doors. For example, we believe that one TV journalist from Pakistan, this is an example that was provided by the consultative network, uh, one uh, TV journalist was imprisoned without, has been in, who had been in, in prison without trial for, five, for eight months, was freed thanks to some discreet diplomatic interventions from a group of Media Freedom Coalition embassies in Pakistan working together. And there are some other examples that, are, that we give in the, in the report. The high-level legal panel has produced fantastic reports um, and practical recommendations for how more can be done such as adopting targeted sanctions and providing emergency visas for journalists at risk, um, a move on that latter point that Canada has actually done. Uh, but uh, Jan will talk about that uh, later. But just to the however, to the but, um, the actions of the Media Freedom Coalition have not been as rapid, bold, or visible as was initially promised. So far, its working methods have been slow, and lacking in transparency. Its communications have been poor, we have to say, very poor. Uh, when statements have been uh, issued, for example, there's not been any one uh, repository for those statements. And as uh, several of our interviews noted, noted, what is the point of a statement that no one sees? Its financial commitments have been small. The UNESCO Global Media Defense Fund's annual budget of only $1.3 million is half what the global conference, launch conference, cost in London in 2019, which cost 3 million US dollars. Finally, the political impacts and effects have been minimal, minimal, with a worsening global situation over the last two years, not really an improving one, as we will hear, as we've already heard from Reporters Without Borders, and we'll also hear from my colleague from Sudan and my colleague from the Philippines. A lot of these problems have been due to COVID. There's no doubt about it. It couldn't have come, this, the pandemic couldn't have come at a worse time, really. Um, at just a month after the first working meeting of the coalition's diplomats in, in Geneva. And of course, COVID has exacerbated the problems for independent media worldwide and shaken the very foundations of what's true and what can and should be reported and what are lies. But our respondents and interviewees mostly felt that over the last two years, there has, there has been a somewhat of a reinjection of energy into the issue of media freedom, partly because of COVID, partly because maybe this was as a result of the fact that uh, people like Maria Ressa and Dmitry Muratov have been recognized by the Nobel Committee and so on. Um, and also that the Media Freedom Coalition has recognized its own shortcomings. So there is a chance now for a reset. Excellent. Well, Jeffrey, you are, you are taking 
Taking it for uh, the entire of the, the Media Freedom Coalition, thank you very much for being their representative. Not rapid enough, not bold enough, lacking in transparency and poor communications. Do you think those are fair assessments of the Media Freedom Coalition for the past two years? Wow. <laughs> um, well, thank, I mean, I, I want to start by thanking everyone who, Mary and, and the whole team that produced the report. I mean, we very much welcome, uh, you know, uh, well-researched, constructive criticism, and that's certainly what we've uh, seen in the report and your recommendations. And, and I think, Mary, you hinted at this a bit. Um, you know, we're, we, we're a young organization. Uh, we've been around for about two and a half years, not even three years. So we're, we're finding our way as we go along. I, I think I'll address some of the broader issues in my intervention uh, a little bit later. But we, you know, by and large, um, the critique that comes out in the report um, jibes with the kinds of discussions that we've had internally, internally in terms of recognizing what our strengths are and what some of our weaknesses are and where we have to put more uh, focus. So maybe what I'll do now, I mean, I, I guess this se segment is on accountability. Why don't I try and address some of the issues with regard to accountability and some of the criticisms that we faced? And then in my later intervention, I'll talk to some of the broad uh, issues. Otherwise, I would dominate the whole stage uh, right now. Um, you know, on accountability, I, I guess you're looking at it in, in two uh, respects. One, how do we um, engage around the world uh, for accountability for um, suppression of the media and, and actions against journalists, but also our own internal accountability in terms of the, the membership. So if I can look at the first question uh, initially, one of the, the big focuses, and this is uh, something goes back a, a few months, I mean, to date, to a large extent, um, the Media Freedom Coalition has focused on the issuing of statements, statements um, focusing on country situations, situations of concern, or thematic uh, statements. And um, I, I think there have been some positive effects from those statements. Sometimes it's challenging to measure, uh, you know, measure the results of, uh, of statements. But I think by and large those statements were initiated by members of the Media Freedom Coalition in their capitals. But we've recognized that the people, uh, I mean our people who, who know the best about uh, challenges on the ground are our diplomatic networks. I mean the countries of the Media Freedom Coalition have diplomatic missions on the ground around the world. Um, so we recognize that those are our experts on the situation of media freedom in whatever country around the world. And we put renewed emphasis in energizing our diplomatic networks on the ground, trying to get MFC members to lead in, in specific countries. So targeted um, advocacy and interventions can be tailored to the situations of individual countries. So in some cases, um, quiet diplomacy is more effective. In other cases, um, I, I guess, as we say, naming and shaming may be more productive. Um, other actions that can be taken are presence, diplomatic presence at trials. Um, so by focusing our attentions and energizing our diplomatic, diplomatic networks on, on the ground uh, around the world, I think that um, will give us a, a better opportunity and allow us to up our game in terms of holding countries to account for violations of media freedom. That's great. Did you did you want did you have a second? I'll be very quick. Okay. You know, in terms of our own internal accountability of members, we have uh, revised, and I think we'll sort of I'm about to formally agree on them, our terms of reference, uh, in a way that would allow us to be more deliberate in growth, um, but also to look at how we may spur on dialogues, in, internal dialogues, uh, when uh, us as members of the Media Freedom Coalition need help in specific areas uh, you know, on our own records on media. Freedom. And I think we'll come to that in, in our next interventions and discussions as well. Avais, I want to come to you. You've been at sort of the heart of the Media Freedom Coalition from the non-profit civil society sector as, as the co-chair of the consultative network. I want to ask you whether you think the approaches taken to date by the MFC, in other words, the state, the 22 statements that Jeffrey talks about, the, in, the quiet diplomacy, have they had the kind of impact that you expected when the, the Media Freedom Coalition launched? Um, again, I think uh, it has taken a little bit of while for 
MFC to, 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 to move. Uh, in terms of uh, statements, I think um, maybe uh, not as uh, powerful as they could be. They have generally been, uh, we are civil society organizations, so there is a disconnect. What we want to do is to be much, much bolder. And of course, by definition, countries have to be uh, a little more cautious about it. So, so, so there's that uh, disconnect, but then, uh, <clears throat> In terms of statements, there were, there were a few uh, pretty glaring examples uh, that cannot be ignored. Uh, for example, um, when there were dozens of uh, journalists that were attacked in America in, 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 in those riots, uh, when, uh, when uh, Israel bombed media organizations, uh, when India uh, blocked internet access for months and months, those were issues which, which did not figure in the MFC. And when you have that thing, not only will it damage the credibility of the MFC, it will damage press freedom itself. So uh, uh, I think in some mechanism can be developed as to what we are going to, uh, uh, that we, what will we respond on, not where it happens. That's very important, otherwise, uh, uh, leaders of countries have already started saying that maybe it has double standards. And we need to be very careful that we, we, we sort of manage uh, uh, those that, uh, that happens. In terms, uh, like Jeffrey has said, I think um, uh, the uh, diplomatic network, activating the diplomatic network uh, has great potential. And uh, as Mary has pointed out, it has already uh, resulted in the release of one journalist that I know uh, of who was jailed for eight months. And then later, just last month, he was acquitted. So poor guy was jailed for no reason at all. The second part where uh, uh, MFC member countries were, uh, 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 were, were effective was that the media wanted to bring out a, a law related, to, which would be a super regulator, which was really a draconian law. And uh, MFC members publicly uh, uh, in Pakistan spoke about it. Uh, they met uh, with the journalist organizations and the government has had to move back. So there's tremendous, tremendous power of the uh, MFC uh, if it, uh, when, it is, when it exercises it. Thank you. So a number of you have spoken about the way in which it's really key for the Media Freedom Coalition to be successful, that members hold one another to account. I think, Mary, it was the thing that you rated poorest. It got a, a full red, not even an amber red. So for the second part of our discussion, we're going to look at this internal democratic backsliding and accountability within the Media Freedom Coalition itself. That seems to be absolutely the heart of of whether or not the Media Freedom Coalition will ultimately be successful. We're going to have two interventions. I'd like to invite Lina Yassin to uh, make her intervention. She's an academic researcher and a former journalist from Sudan who helped with this report. Lina. All right, thank you so much for having me. So I'm going to try and walk you through Sudan's journey with the MFC. Sudan was one of the earliest members of the MFC. In fact, I think the MFC came as a really good time for Sudan. The country was fresh out of a historic revolution that took down a 30-year-old um, uh, dictatorship system, and we finally have a transitional government that is willing to make change. So by joining the MFC, the new transitional government of Sudan at the time, um, led by Prime Minister Abdullah Hamdok, signed the MFC to prove that media freedom and reform is going to be on top of his priorities and that they will take it seriously. Um, during the signing, notably during the signing of the MFC um, in New York um, at the UN, Prime Minister Hamdok said that in the new Sudan, no journalists will ever be arrested. So the future was looking bright for, um, for media freedom in Sudan, and indeed it was um, immediately after the um, systematic censorship of um, news reports stopped, the um, harassment and raids on media houses came to a halt, and even international broadcasters like the BBC were finally allowed back in the country. 
Um, upon signing the MFC, um, Sudan started a series of um, international projects with the, with the international community to reform the sector. Um, most notably was the um, UNESCO-led roadmap, um, which used the UNESCO indicators for media development. That roadmap was supposed to inform the governments of the needed changes in the sector. Uh, the roadmap was funded by the UK Embassy under funds allocated for the MFC. And um, the roadmap was quite comprehensive. It used a multi-stakeholder approach. They conducted 66 expert meetings, 13 workshops with journalists and other stakeholders in five different states. So it was a very comprehensive roadmap. And when it's finally released, it was a great document, very ambitious, very clear in its goals. And it had 28 action points that the government need to, needed to tackle in order to reform the sector, including legal changes and institutional building. Um, it was great, um, but then as soon as the document was released, um, problems started to arise. First of all, it wasn't clear who is actually leading this um, roadmap, which government entities are involved, but who is going to adopt it. Uh, second problem was that due to the political instability in Sudan at the point, um, there was constant turnover in um, in the governmental staff, and in February 2021, the Prime Minister dissolved the whole cabinet, resulting in new ministers being, um, being stated, and the priorities shifted. It wasn't clear at the time if the new Minister of Information even cared about the roadmap or wanted it to be implemented the same way it was agreed. Um, third problem, with that th which I think was the main problem for all, all Sudan, was the tension between the gov in the government. There was a tension between the military side of the government and the civilian side. It was, it, the tension was very high, resulting sometimes in contradicting actions. Because, for example, the government, uh, the military on one hand would be intimidating journalists, trying to sue them, and the civilian side on one hand would be um, hosting workshops about media freedom and, and transparency and access to information. So those were actions in two different um, positions coming from the same government, which made people really confused about who's actually in power and who's deciding things. Um, fast forward to November, last November 2021, uh, that tension exploded, resulting in a military coup that took down the, um, the prime minister and uh, the, the military arrested multiple ministers. And the media freedom work that was done under MFC was completely erased. Um, journalists were back to being jailed, harassed, um, beaten. Uh, the uh, Al Jazeera license was removed. And actually, just yesterday, the BBC crew in Sudan was arrested. So you can see that things are not as bright as they were two years ago. And um, honestly, moving forward, we're not sure what's going to happen for the future of media freedom of Sudan, in Sudan. What can be learned from this and from the research outcomes is that most of the international efforts were short-term. Uh, they were uncoordinated, but, and they also just lacked um, engagement with the Sudanese entities. That's, that's one of the things that were pointed out in most of the interviews that we've conducted. And I've, we've recently spoke to, in late 2021, we spoke to some journalists about the current situation. And they all told us that they're quite disappointed in the international communities, specifically the MFC for their silence regarding the, uh, the situation in Sudan. Um, right now, the, the political scene in Sudan is quite complicated. It's almost impossible to predict what is going to happen next. But um, I'm quite sure that um, um, the future for media freedom in Sudan is not as bright as it was two years ago. Uh, I'm not sure if the MFC is actually ever going to have a real impact in Sudan, because um, so far it's just going to remain words and papers that were never able to be implemented. So yeah, thank you. And I'd now like to invite Susan Kofji, the project director from the po Foreign Policy Center, who's helped put together this report and also this fantastic event. Susan. Thank you, Jody. At the Foreign Policy Center, I lead a research project examining risks and threats facing journalists who specifically investigate financial crime and corruption. I think it will come as no surprise to those here that the countries with the highest rates of corruption are also those amongst which rank the lowest for media freedom. The political and business elites who enrich themselves at the expense of their fellow countrymen and women are strongly motivated to avoid the public scrutiny of their affairs and have deep pockets to shut down the unwanted glare of journalistic inquiry. At home, that might be through creating a regressive media environment or funding harassment attacks or even murder of journalists. Yet illicit wealth is often funneled abroad to other countries, particularly in the West, where it can also be used to pay for services to intimidate journalists, 
This includes vexatious legal action referred to as SLAPs, strategic lawsuits against public participation. There are many examples, but I'll provide a couple just to illustrate the overall issue. Last week, the UK National Crime Agency won a case to seize four million from the UK-based family members of an Azerbaijani politician. The NCA relied upon the work of the Organised Crime and Corruption Reporting Project, OCCRP, which uncovered a complex money laundering system they called the Azerbaijani laundromat. Between 2018 and 2020, OCCRP's co-founder, a Romanian citizen, was pursued through the London libel courts by the very same Azerbaijani politician. He had ultimately decided to settle the case on the eve of the trial, but by then OCCRP had had to raise hundreds of thousands of pounds to mount a legal defence, hand over swathes of information during an invasive discovery process, and use up their valuable time and resources diverting them from their work. The Azerbaijan laundromat had found that 2.9 billion had been laundered out of Azerbaijan at a time of severe crackdown for the country, including the arrest and imprisonment of independent investigative journalists. There are similar laundromats linked to Russia, other former Soviet Union countries, and elsewhere where the situation for media freedom has been in rapid decline. When, in 2019, journalists exposed significant corruption in Kyrgyzstan's customs service, including the transfer of 700 million to Germany, the UK, the US and Dubai, countries where, amongst other things, large real estate investments were being made, it was the local journalists who paid the consequences. They had their media assets frozen, they experienced harassment, physical arrest and um, death threats. In 2020, we at the FPC surveyed 63 investigative journalists working to uncover financial crime and corruption in 41 countries. While the majority of the respondents were experiencing a wide range of threats, it was the legal threats that they strongly highlighted as a matter of key concern. More than 70% had received legal threats um, as a result of information they had published. When the Maltese investigative journalist Daphne Caruana Galizia was murdered in 2017, she had 47 civil libel suits open against her, most of them brought by Maltese politicians and their business associates, which she described as an intimidation strategy as they retreated under siege from her investigations into their corrupt practices. These legal threats were not just issued in Malta, but also in the UK and the US. Since then, the use of slaps appears to have only proliferated the purpose is to remove information from the public domain before publication or to take it down afterwards by tying up the journalists in costly, time-consuming and stressful legal procedures. As one investigative journalist, frankly and perhaps quite crudely, said to me last year, why go to the trouble of murdering someone when you can simply sue them into submission? Much of our research at FPC has focused on cases connected to the UK but SLAPs are an issue within many MFC member states. A few examples. In Serbia, the investigative media outlet Crick has been faced with 10 legal procedures filed mostly by people in power or business people close to the government, requesting damages three times more than their annual media budget. In Slovenia, three journalists at investigative news outlets near Senzoriano were hit with a total of 39 SLAP suits last August, lodged against them by an unofficial advisor to the Prime Minister. Here in Estonia, journalists working on an investigative programme Eyewitness on the Estonian national broadcaster ERR have faced, slap suits, have faced a slap suit since 2018 after they published an investigation into alleged criminal activities linked with a Finnish NGO, which included the transfer of hundreds of thousands of euros through an Estonian shell company. In a welcome step in December, just, just gone, the US recognised the importance of protecting journalists from slaps in its new anti-corruption strategy. It also launched a global defamation defence fund to protect journalists from this form of attack. The US, Canada and Australia have anti-slap legislation already in place in some states, but it would be strengthened by the introduction of laws at a federal level. In Europe, the EU and the Council of Europe are both examining this issue and developing proposals for reform. But yet the Media Freedom Coalition has yet to be active on this issue, and it could and should play a more active role in encouraging the adoption of anti-slap initiatives in its member states. Moreover, the MFC should take more of a strategic approach within its membership to recognise and address the fundamental systematic issue of corruption and how it links to media freedom. It must ensure that its member countries are not servicing illicit wealth through opaque and ineffectual financial regulation, 
that can not only underlie attacks against individual journalists, but also wider crackdowns on media freedom and civil society. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. John, that's a pretty sobering picture that Lena and Susan have just painted, both of the deterioration or the, the, the pot potentially the, the inability of something like the Media Freedom Coalition to, to intervene in Sudan and make a difference. And then, of course, the, the fact that so many journalists are facing these legal threats that emanate from countries that are members of the Media Freedom Coalition. The high-level legal panel has produced four reports all of which actually contain recommendations for things that MFC members themselves could do. Can you just talk to us about what MFC members can do to improve accountability amongst themselves? Of course. Thank you, Jodie. And uh, yes, I want to, I want to change um, a gears from statements to action. Um, I want to say something, a, a preliminary point about statements. Maria Ressa, Nobel Laureate, I'm just taking my high-level panel hat off for a moment, is my client. Um, it was surprising to see how few states signed up to the statement in relation to the Philippines. And Mary, you know, the analysis um, in your report is, is sobering in that, in that regard. Um, you know, this is someone who has not only faced great challenges, but is, is, is an amazing ambassador for everything that we ought uh, and the media freedom um, states ought to hold dear in relation to um, media uh, freedom. But I think as a panel, we have always felt from the very start that for us to be useful, we need to focus as a panel because we are the independent advisory body of the Media Freedom Coalition. We are not an NGO. We are not campaigners. Um, we have had to focus on action. And um, the advisory reports that have been published, unfortunately, during COVID-19, um, obviously uh, represent a great deal of work that has uh, gone into formulating uh, concrete uh, recommendations, but I would say they're a tip of the iceberg of the work that we have done in the last two years. For us, um, in relation to those reports, our view is not, we've done the reports, now implement them. Our view is we've done the reports, you've all had plenty of time to read them. Now is the time to engage with us as your advisory body uh, to discuss customized solutions for each state. That may be something that Canada wants to do domestically. It may be something that um, uh, Canada wants to promote as a co-chair for other states because they're all, all, already doing things. And what I think we need to also take step, step, uh, stock sorry, of, of, of some of the action. A bill has passed the Parliament in the Netherlands for an emergency visa, directly related to our recommendation. And we've worked very, very hard with NGOs in, 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 in the Netherlands um, uh, on that. That's been a real joint effort. Equally, um, the steps that Canada has taken in relation to its international protection scheme um, these are not conservative steps. And for us as a panel, uh, our focus on those four areas of reports, for us, those are four areas where we can go beyond statements as a media freedom um, a coalition. And um, some states will have their own priorities in respect of um, all of these different areas. Those reports are the starting point for a detailed conversation. And are you having that detailed conversation there? I mean, that's the thing that I think for many people it's difficult to see yes. from the outside yes. how, how much of that engagement is actually happening. I mean, I, I think it's fair to say that we have been quite patient um, because of COVID-19, because a lot of this engagement does need to be in person. It sometimes needs to be with ministers, etc. Some of the engagement that we have had uh, gives us cause for cautious optimism, but there is a systemic issue within the Media Freedom Coalition that has very little to do with the panel, and it's all over the, the report um, that has been authored, which is you know, how will the Media Freedom Coalition itself organize itself. And now with this leadership block, that's, it's, it's a huge opportunity for us to be engaging directly with the executive group and, of course, with, with, with the new um, uh, co-chairs. So 
we have started, including around this conference. Um, um, but I, 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 in particular with Canada, we have had um, very, very good conversations and it is, it, it is leading to things. Um, and I have hope with the new co-chair, the Netherlands and the United States and other, other members of, of, of the executive group. But for us, it really needs to be about action, not just the action that we are advancing in our reports. Sudan is, is a fantastic example. I, uh, uh, Minister Abdul Bari is an old friend of mine. Before the coup, um, you know, we had started doing some work together, the high-level panel, and Sudan slaps absolutely critical to our work as a panel in the next um, uh, two years. So hopefully as we open up, we can also raise awareness ab about our work. We see ourselves as a way of building capacity into the media freedom um, uh, coalition, whether it's accountability within or accountability out with. Jeffrey, give us a sense of how this works within the Media Freedom Coalition. So we've heard from Jan uh, that clearly Canada is engaging and is taking on board some of the recommendations. How, just give us a sense of how those dynamics work within the Media Freedom Coalition and how far you're able to encourage some of the other countries who are members to, to have the kind of engagement that you are having. And what are the barriers to some of those other countries doing what Canada's doing? You know, I, I don't think there have necessarily been barriers. I mean, sometimes, uh, you know, it's capacity limits and, and, and things like that. I mean, in, in, if we look at action, I think to a certain extent, uh, the recommendations that we get from the consultative network, um, which is uh, making us focus better on specific cases, that has led to the greater emphasis we put on the diplomatic uh, efforts. I must admit, and, and this is, comes out of conversations we've had with Jan and, and with um, Catherine, the co-chair, um, that the high-level panel of legal, legal experts with their uh, four thematic reports have set a very high bar. Um, and it, it's only been recently that we've been focusing on uh, the idea of bilateral conversations yes. with the panel um, to help individual states um, uh, achieve some of the recommendations in the report. So this is, these are really new conversations, and I think it is uh, steering the MFC and the membership of the MFC in a new direction to engage on responding to the reports. Um, by through bilateral conversations with the legal panel and by looking at them as a resource that can be offered to states to help improve any deficiencies that they might have. And anti-slap legislation is clearly one of the areas I think that the panel would be able to assist. Can with. I add just yes, one thing, Goody? I mean, something more powerful than a statement about um, legislation that's going in the wrong direction or legislation that is positively... Um, you know, antithetical to media freedom. Something more powerful than a statement is 15 page legal opinion that is public and has had 15 independent lawyers sign off on it that the Media Freedom Coalition can then stand behind. That is the work of the Venice Commission within the Council of Europe. We see ourselves in, in, a, in, a, in a similar role. Of course, on individual cases, slightly different with individual journalists, but you know, for action, when it's legislation, I mean, the legislation has to be looked at in the context of that state's international legal obligations. This is, not, this is not a statement. This is not aspirational. This is a matter of international legal obligation. I th we really need to move towards um, looking at um, uh, uh, obligation rather than aspiration. Obligation and accountability. And yes. Mary, this is the area that in the report you rated the Media Freedom Coalition most poorly. In your assessment, what is the challenge in MFC members holding one another to account? And in you, you highlight the, the example of Sudan, but also of Afghanistan, which remains a member of the Media Freedom Coalition, despite the fact that, that you know, the media has now collapsed and, and journalists are now targeted. What for you is the real challenge for Media Freedom members holding, holding each other accountable? Well, it is really quite amazing, isn't it, that Sudan and uh, the Af Afghanistan are still members of the coalition, uh, considering the political changes that have happened there. And uh, as we know, the Taliban 
in Afghanistan. I think 40% uh, of the media outlets there have, have disappeared. Uh, so I think seven out of every eight female journalists has no longer uh, have got a job. Yet there's been utter silence publicly from the MFC about that. I know things are happening behind closed doors, but can I just remind you of something that is in the terms of reference of the Media Freedom Coalition, which is to shine a, shine a light on violations related to and abuses of media freedom, bringing them to the attention of the global public. So it's not, of course, you, was, you were saying, Jeff, it's partly about pub, private diplomacy, but it's not just that. It's about, sh should be, I would say, shouting from the rooftops. So what is stopping the Media Freedom Coalition shouting from the rooftops. I suppose it's actually, I mean, our analysis is that it's a sort of cultural blockage in a way. So sort of, it's almost like the difference, but I, the way I see it is the difference between the way the, Depart the old Department for International Development in the UK went about things and the uh, f the Foreign Office goes about things. Now they've, they've merged together, so it'd be interesting to see how they can, uh, you know, combine those two cultures. But it's, it's this sort of reluctance by civil servants and diplomats to go public. And um, I think that's partly at the core of some of the systemic problems that the MFC has had. But um, I think that maybe now with a better uh, public presence, uh, the MFC will address some of this sort of the, 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 the public-facing aspect of its, of its work. Avais, you've obviously been very closely involved in, in the Media Freedom Coalition's workings. From your perspective, what, what did you see that you felt was, was making it difficult for members of the coalition to call one another out? Or you, you mentioned the statement or the lack of a statement, for example, on the United States. Can you give us a bit of insight for those people who are not closely involved in the discussions about why you think, what, what you think is holding it back? I think uh, most of the countries, although there has been uh, um, a lot of effort and it has gone to, uh, you know, now uh, 50 countries, but most of the countries are like-minded countries. They work with each other, they support each other, and it's difficult, what my analysis has been, to call themselves out. And even with the 50 membership, uh, still it looks pretty much like the international community and a lot more effort needs to be done to make it look like the real world. And I think when you have more diversity of membership, then there would be a point where some country would be able to say and call the other one out. Right now, uh, MFC are like-minded countries. They see a problem if it occurs somewhere else. They don't see a problem when it is occurring within themselves. So this, I think, is a big problem. And Eventually, uh, MFC will have to have protocols which says when the statement would be issued or do away with the statement at all. You know, you have um, the diplomatic network, you know, diplomatic, yeah, the networks that they have, very powerful, support for media development, very powerful. But unless there's credibility in public, uh, Either you don't have uh, public pronouncements and announcements and statements, and if you have the statements, make sure that it is applied uh, throughout. So that's, 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 that's a weak point. Of and that's one of the things I think that the report pulls out is the need for transparency around metrics and, and how you make assessments and when you make assessments. I think there's interesting as well about this balance between whether you have like-minded countries that enable you to move at speed, which is one of the arguments for having a grouping like the MFC as opposed to putting it all in a United Nations function versus uh, a much more a much broad-based organization. I'm going to go on to the next theme now, uh, and that's the question of media sustainability. We heard at the beginning that one of the recommendations or the, one of the big recommendations from this report is a re-injection of energy, but also of funds. 
Um, and there were some criticisms around the amount of money and the ways in which money has been used um, for the MSC. And we're going to have two interveners now. So I'd like to invite Nick Benakista, Senior Director for the Centre for International Media Assistance, to the stage. He's had a bit of a break from his own presenting. So I hope, hope you're feeling rested, <laughs> Nick, after racing here Thanks. to get for the start. So Nick and then Ika Fernandez from the Philippines. Thanks very much, Jody, and uh, thanks for the invitation to speak today. I think we should applaud the MFC for uh, opening itself up to this criticism from this report and uh, looking to do better and to think strategically about how collectively we can do better. So I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity. Uh, I'm, as I've gotten up onto the stage, I've realized that uh, it's not clear to me whether I'm here to convince you to work on sustainability or to offer my, guideline, my guidance on, on how, to, uh, how to tackle the question of sustainability. I'm, I'm going to try and focus on the latter a bit more, recognizing that in all the conversations that we've had since the beginning of uh, this initiative, it's been striking how much everyone here agrees that freedom and sustainability, as Mary so eloquently put this morning, are two sides of the same coin. And uh, I'll be very brief. Please read the latest World Trends Report on media development and freedom of expression. Look at the report that emanated from uh, the International Forum for Information and Democracy. The evidence is, is compelling and it's clear that the crisis that we are facing in uh, freedom of expression and independent media is exacerbated and deeply intertwined uh, with a crisis of sustainability in the sector. We know this. News revenue uh, has uh, fallen by half over five years. Newspaper revenue, I should say, a bellwether of the sector as a whole, and two-thirds over 10 years. Uh, two uh, organizations that need not be named uh, take over 50% of all digital advertising revenue. Uh, as I say, the evidence is really clear, and I, and I hope that we don't require any more convincing because it's been one of the most refreshing parts of the MFC is to have on stage uh, freedom of expression advocates and media development advocates beginning to harmonize uh, in their uh, perceptions and views of the world. So uh, I think what you can do to uh, address this media sustainability uh, is to continue uh, to describe this intertwined challenge that we have. Uh, it is continu to continue to amplify the message um, that human progress economic prosperity, health, social cohesion, the 2030 agenda is threatened when news media does not have the resources it requires and the enabling environment it requires to remain independent and resilient. The evidence for this is also clear uh, and the infodemic associated with the COVID pandemic I think has been obviously a very stark reminder of this. So with this recognition, uh, and with the MFC being a very powerful vehicle for communicating this globally, what can we do to work together to translate that recognition uh, of independent and viable media as a key pillar of our society, as a basic public good, as UNESCO has, has uh, described in this last World Trends Report? How do we translate that recognition into action? I think there are three ways. First is, that the MSC can help us to boost the amount of international assistance flowing to the media sector. As uh, remarked in the last session today, uh, the amount of aid as a percent of official development assistance that goes to the media sector has hovered around 0.3 percent, something between 450 million and 600 million depending on the year, uh, a paltry sum. That could easily be tripled. Uh, SEMA has said that uh, 1 percent seems like a reasonable target. 1% uh, of overseas development assistance. Uh, we just learned today that uh, CETA has not only met but has exceeded uh, that threshold and we applaud C uh, CETA for, for that commitment. Uh, and look, that's still a modest amount and we know how to use those resources well. In this room are, uh, is a great deal of expertise and our partners around the world, we know how to spend that well. Uh, Nobel laureate uh, Maria Ressa's uh, outlet, Rappler, would not exist today if, if it were not for international support. And there is a generation of highly committed, pure play, frequently digital news outlets around the world that need support. But more than that, uh, that support is fundamental for policy reforms, professionalization, support for business models, media literacy, efforts to counter disinformation. That, that, that aid works. A UN report also confirms that recently. 
So while we can do more with the with more aid and while we can also continue to make that aid more effective, international funding and technical assistance alone will not fundamentally solve the problem of media sustainability without greater political will to create a better enabling environment for media. And because the MFC brings together civil society, international aid community, high level diplomatic representation, it's uniquely positioned to help with those challenges uh, and in, in two other ways. So the MFC can help to mainstream the norms of independent media into diplomatic relations, trade negotiations, regulatory debates, and other international norm, norm setting efforts. Uh, as Ambassador uh, Tazib also remarked upon earlier today, the, the European Union's generalized scheme of preferences plus arrangement slashes tariffs for countries that implement 27 human rights conventions, including access to information. That's one example. Uh, that, uh, that scheme uh, added a great deal of pressure in the case of Pakistan uh, for implementing freedom of information. The MFC can help us to identify those kinds of mechanisms and to make sure that they are implemented and at perhaps a greater scale than we've, we've seen in the past. Another example, you know, there are about 100 platform regulation inquiries, reviews, and proceedings worldwide uh, looking at uh, platform, internet platforms, and their potential monopolization in the online digital space. Uh, this is according to data from Carleton University and the University of Freiburg. The, the result of these inquiries the, as we know, the, re the result of the re regulation that comes out of this debate about what to do with these internet platforms is going to be hugely consequential uh, for media around the world and for media in, our, in, in, in the, the North, uh, in the U.S., where I come from. Uh, so uh, we, the MFC can help to ensure that the interests of independent media and the values of a free press get represented in these debates. At the moment, I think we're feeling like we're on the margins there is a lot of expertise about how internet governance, how platform regulation filters down to independent media and information as a public good. Help us uh, at the MFC to ensure that those voices, those concerns, those sensibilities are heard and incorporated into the ways that we decide to shape the digital media sphere. And uh, finally, uh, and building a little bit on what Rebecca said, lead by example. The MFC could be a space where all governments commit to creating a better, better enabling environment for their own countries. And uh, we are all, to some degree, uh, in the same boat. I think there are more resources available in some countries than others, and there's a potentially a great schism and inequality in access to quality journalism that may emerge in the coming years. But at the moment, we see uh, the dangers and the risks of failing media viability in all of our countries. There are news deserts uh, afflicting every country around the world. Um, so, and there are interesting examples, uh, some from the m countries represented on our panel. Uh, Canada's digital news tax credit, for instance, uh, is the kind of an initiative that you could bring to the MFC conference. And let's look at those and let's frankly evaluate them and how well they're performing and how well they uh, meet the objectives of preserving uh, the sustainability of independent media while also respecting its independence. Uh, I think the, these types of measures where the state becomes a guarantor of, of journalism as a public good carry great risks. Uh, and we see frequently the use of these kinds of techniques to capture and stifle media. So we, we need to have a big debate. Uh, we need to be uh, clear and transparent uh, but when there are successes that are well-intentioned, let's bring them and applaud them. And let's hold each other to account for ensuring that uh, we're, we're not abusing uh, this, this space to stifle rather than to enable. Nick, I'm going to have to ask you to wrap yeah, sorry. up if that's all right. Yep. So um, these laws exist in Uruguay, Switzerland, and Canada. Uh, that's actually my, my final remark in any case. I think there's, uh, if we can seek your support in these three ways, I think we can accomplish a great deal in the years to come. So thanks. Thank you. And our second intervention is from Ika Fernandez, who is an academic researcher from the Philippines who contributed to the report, and it's a pre-recorded video. Okay, 
uh, good afternoon from the Philippines. So given this topic of economic threats to media, the Philippine experience is quite an interesting case to jump off from uh, based on our review of the UK's Global Media Freedom Campaign uh, in the from the period of 2019 to early 2021. So based on our review, what we saw was uh, something you can call a diplomacy-heavy but grant-light approach, you know, attempting to support certain outcomes related to media freedom but with minimal funding. So some context. To this day, uh, the Philippines under Duterte still rejects the narrative of state suppression of press freedom. It says that it's not about media protection uh, but media responsibility, saying that um, all of these events, uh, these threats, uh, the killings, no, it's not about state abuse but can be traced to an industrial uh, set of issues no, tied to journalist integrity, labor rights, um, the monopolies over video ownership, as well as um, broad uh, lack of public media literacy uh, tied to disinformation, misinformation, as well uh, as the pandemic itself. So uh, this reflects the kind of tightrope uh, that uh, the UK and other donors have had to play in the Philippines. And you see this in uh, the way that the UK has designed its portfolio. Um, building from its human rights and governance portfolio. So uh, its portfolio has three components. No? Uh, first is uh, the standard public-facing advocacy events, uh, speaking about uh, the importance of media freedom and press safety in a functioning democracy, and of course, projecting the UK as a vanguard of such ideals. Uh, the second track is uh, using public and private diplomacy, using conversations, dialogues with government officials, uh, media actors, and accompanying certain processes, uh, such as that of Maria Ressa and ABS-CBN. And thirdly, provision of small uh, grants to grassroot, uh, grassroots NGOs and media workers. And for the third part, when I say it's um, small, no, it's very modest. Uh, during the first round of implementation, the UK Embassy in the Philippines had 70,000 quid for uh, operations, but that was lashed to 15,000 uh, due to pandemic uh, aid cuts. No? Uh, the current fiscal year, the call was for 10,000 uh, pounds cap. No? So, uh, Given all of this, you can see it's very, very modest, but uh, we found that despite this limitation, uh, the UK implemented uh, Media Freedom Campaign in the Philippines generally was successful as a pilot project, a pilot diplomacy initiative, uh, which, was, which people found as relevant and timely uh, in terms of the, the current context in the Philippines. No? Uh, when he spoke to other partners, he said it fit pretty well as a top-up mechanism to support pre-existing structures for monitoring and financing. And when he spoke to journalists who knew of this uh, project and were involved uh, in these dialogues, he said that if it were you know, any other time, it would be just lip service, but given how embattled they are, they found that no Knowing that certain uh, diploma diplomatic actors were uh, in their corner was very, very important. So it is also uh, observed no, that for uh, the real regional trial court judges who were handling cases that of Maria Reza and Ray Santos, uh, they were a bit you know, more careful knowing that uh, diplomatic actors from the UK, Canada, Australia, Belgium, France, and the EU were there watching the legal proceedings, whether uh, online or uh, on face-to-face um, -face before the lockdowns. No? And when he spoke to the uh, beneficiaries who were deftly insurrected no, with some strategic uh, perspective, uh, they said that, yeah, it's smaller compared to other actors, uh, but in terms of flexibility, the UK is very flexible and provides certain you know, access to, to legal and diplomatic channels and networks which would not be possible elsewhere. So it works, no? Uh, however, uh, impact and visibility were minimal, particularly for those who were not involved uh, directly in the project, no? Uh, and, and so this is something which applies also to UNESCO, which has been operating in the Philippines for the longest time, but the Global uh, Media Defense Fund, which UNESCO administers, is not something properly known, uh, much less the UK's role in the fund as, um, as a contributor. So uh, more importantly, no? Uh, at the end of the day, uh, the intention was to support uh, safety and accountability. And in terms of uh, the issuances, uh, such as that of the, uh, the Media Freedom Coalition, which uh, they had a joint statement on the Philippines, um, the timing was odd because, of course, it, it was released during the early part of the lockdowns. And that, so in, in terms of actual um, translation to accountability, that's something that uh, arguably didn't hit the mark given that, uh, as people said, uh, these workshops and statements are nice, even fact-checking, which is very, very popular, 
nice to have, but until it translates directly to legal uh, outcomes, to accountability, to justice, then uh, we're not really moving the needle here. So moving forward, again, uh, interesting as a pilot, but sustained and substantial effectiveness will depend on how um, the UK and other actors can collaborate and ensure um, uh, continuous uh, positive pressure on uh, in the space. Uh, it's going to be important more so now uh, with the upcoming May 2022 elections, which will determine the national trajectory of the Philippines for the next decade easily. Uh, but again, uh, with this grant, uh, light and diplomacy heavy approach, you have two limitations. One is that uh, it depends on the capacity and deftness of, of diplomatic personnel to navigate the terrain. And second is uh, there is a perceived uh, privileging of certain figureheads, uh, such as that of um, uh, Nobel Prize winner Maria Ressa, over other regional grassroots actors who are, are facing uh, similar threats no, but aren't, uh, uh, aren't receiving uh, similar support, uh, particularly those who are associated with uh, the left no, or the Philippine Communist Party. So given all of this, it raises very interesting questions regarding uh, the interplay between international initiatives and local realities. Like, at the end of the day, you have to put your money where your mouth is. So how do we now uh, adjust our implementation to translate intentions and vision into actual action? Uh, thank you very much. Thank you to Ike. So we heard the, the phrase diplomacy heavy grant light of ACE, and it's one of the things that the report references is in the context of the ambitions of the Media Freedom Coalition of Investment in Media uh, Development more generally, the grants given sort of on behalf of the Media Freedom Coalition were very minimal of ACE. Where do you see the Media Freedom Coalition intervening in the media sustainability space? Okay. Um, <clears throat> to be fair, uh, Media Freedom Coalition uh, only recently, a couple of months ago, uh, did they start focusing on media sustainability, media development. The first part was taken for on the other side of the coin, which is uh, media freedoms. So uh, within that, uh, now a working group has been formed on media uh, development. Uh, and that group basically has been tasked with making the, uh, the media support uh, more effective. Uh, what still needs to be done is for uh, the countries to, to make the political decision of increasing the funds. So that is not a part uh, of the uh, working group. So they need to make the political uh, uh, will or political decision that uh, Nick pointed out to make, uh, to have it at, uh, at 1%. And uh, they have engaged uh, uh, very uh, seriously and constructively, for example, uh, the, uh, the effective, the principles of effective media support have been discussed in the uh, working group. And uh, uh, so, so there's a lot of, um, I am very optimistic that there's a potential that the structures have been uh, set. Uh, what I would say is that um, as they increase the level of funding, it has to be done with some care. Uh, for example, uh, two points I would like to make. First is that in large parts of the world, including large parts uh, uh, of the developing countries, uh, a lot of media has been self-sustaining for decades and decades and have gone through booms and busts and have remained self-sustaining and independent. And so it is important that in giving support, we do not create models of dependency as has happened in the case of the infrastructure that has been built around civil society organizations. We are dependent now for yearly grants, two yearly grants, and it's very, very important that media does not fall into the same trap. Secondly, and has, as has been pointed out in the principles uh, part, it is very important that media be recognized uh, uh, as a public good that needs support in its own right, not as a means to achieve certain other ends or to publicize certain uh, other thing. And I think um, uh, 
Uh, the only thing it should aim for is to promote media independence and to promote media uh, pl pluralism. And um, if it is used for any other means, there are alternate methods, um, uh, alternate models uh, vying for influence uh, related to media for development. And I think media for development is a, uh, we went through the bruising debates in the 1980s in UNESCO, and uh, we don't want to go through that again. And I think it needs to be done uh, with care. Also, Nick is 100% correct on the need uh, MFC has the power to be able to make an impact on uh, reform uh, the online platforms. For example, it's, it's, things are bad all over the world, but they are terrible as far as developing countries are concerned. For example, in Pakistan, there is no Pakistani organization or website in the first 30 rankings. So you can imagine how much of it goes to, uh, uh, to them. And uh, I was looking at it, uh, if you look at, um, if you do Pakistan news, newspapers, the majority are international newspapers. So we need to say that you have to give preference to local content, and that is something I think the MFC could take for. One thing that has, uh, uh, that has uh, devastated and decimated um, uh, the, the, the business models in developing countries that have sort of uh, missed the radar uh, um, because in developed countries is the lack of respect for copyright. In developing countries, uh, you put something uh, on the website uh, a newspaper with all the expenses, you put it there, or a content, in two minutes, it's on a hundred other websites that do nothing but steal content and go from that. So there is no business model that can work if there is such, and that is going to be a win-win model if MFC could work to develop, uh, as it did in, in the case of uh, access to information, uh, and it, uh, a number of uh, the support uh, and the encouragement led to many countries uh, uh, implementing access to information laws. If they could be done to improve the respect for copyright, uh, uh, you know, it would improve the level of, um, it would improve accountability of the media because they will be responsible. It will improve, um, it will be good for the donor countries, the countries, it will be excellent for the countries uh, in the developing countries. And so I that think goes back to the question of enabling environments as well as investment. Sure. Jan, we heard about how important international support for financial support, but also enabling support for Rappler in the Philippines was. You just talk a little bit about that nexus. Yes, of course. And I want to, I want to deal with the other side of that coin because the other side of that coin represents most of the actions that have been taken against Maria Ressa in the Philippines because of the way uh, Rappler was um, uh, set up. We say, obviously, unfairly characterized. I want to just go back to um, uh, uh, a very practical um, point, which is recommendation three. Um, and this is, it goes to accountability, but it, it also goes to uh, media sustainability. You've got these 50 members right? They've got to show that they're doing something on this coalition. And it may be some members want to pay in rather than give effect to, you know, the report on um, safe refuge, whatever it is. It's very important for those funds to be coming in. But once those funds come in, hopefully, we also need to live in the real world. You know, two journalists um, were given the Nobel Prize this year. Uh, Rappler um, uh, had a foreign inv investor, but was not foreign owned. Now, the diff distinction between foreign ownership and foreign investment is not a distinction without a difference. It's the difference between being um, uh, criminally li liable in the Philippines and not. So even when these grants are being given, these investments are, are, are being made, the countries in, in, into which these investments are going have to play fair. You can't be prosecuted <laughs> um, for receiving a foreign investment. The Philippines itself has entered into a number of bilateral investment treaties encouraging foreign investment. 
Uh, so that's point one in relation to, uh, uh, to the Philippines. The second Nobel laureate, uh, Dmitry Muratov, the foreign agent law. The, the foreign agent law in Russia is um, a, a bulwark to allowing anyone but the state to pump funds into media. And so it's, it's very, very important. Obviously, we, we, we want the money, and that's the, that's the hardest thing. <laughs> But once um, uh, those funds are in place, there also needs to be environments capable of receiving those funds. Um, and that's what I, was one of the points in the Nobel I thought was so powerful, is that independent media is literally being strangled uh, in those uh, two countries through these systemic uh, uh, restrictions. Jeffrey, how does the MFC view its role in relation to the development of sustainable media? Is it about encouraging your peers to invest more money? Is it about creating that enabling environment or improving the environment that we've, we've heard from Aves and Jan? Where does the MFC sit on that? Because you can't do everything. No, and you know, maybe I'll just, this is a fascinating discussion and there's a lot here to take in. I mean, just this segment has covered a lot of ground and it, it reminds me of some of the struggles we've had sort of in, in the cultural sector, which overlaps with media in Canada, you know, forever uh, in, in terms of creating an appropriate enabling environment, one for a vibrant uh, Francophone, French language cultural production in a North America that north of uh, you know the Mexico US border is overwhelmingly English speaking but also for creating a vibrant Canadian English language culture in a in a you know large physically country physically large country but a small population just to the north of the United States so um, and, and there's no easy answers I mean we've uh, I, I think we've been broadly successful, probably more successful in creating a, a vibrant, uh, distinct French language uh, culture. Um, so I, I think, you know, listening to Nick and listening to Ika, there are um, lots of great ideas there that will give us, um, uh, you know, food for thought. I'm glad, you know, Owais spoke to the recent efforts of the Media Freedom Coalition in creating a working group uh, to look at this. And Oase, you said you were optimistic, so I'm going to let him <laughs> speak. We're, we've heard a lot of criticism here, but there's some optimism. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it comes down to funding. And again, uh, in UNESCO, we have a, a good partner. But as Jan has just said, some countries, I mean, we put money in. They're, they're, how is the UNESCO fund going to operate in, in Russia, for example? Um, there's big challenges there. Uh, I also, I, I think it's an important point that Ika raised about um, th there's smaller players that are just as important that could get missed. Again, I think this is where we have to rely on the expertise of our diplomats on the ground to identify some of the smaller players. Yeah. When I think back to my, you know, diplomatic career, I, you know, sometimes we're working with big players on big issues, but often it's, you know, we, we, the only, our meager funds, you know, $5,000 or 2,000 Canadian dollars has been a, a lifeline for a small yes. project with not just on media, but on a yeah. range of things. So I, I think, um, it's a new area for the, uh, for the MFC, but I think this discussion um, has given us lots uh, to think about. And, and we do have uh, the working group. Um, I guess uh, there were two more points I wanted to make, but I can only remember one of them. One of them is, um, uh, you know, on the online aspect, the internet aspect, the Freedom Online Coalition is another um, coalition. I think there's good overlap between uh, some of the same issues and real opportunities for us to strengthen links with the Freedom Online Coalition uh, moving forward. And I think we'd hoped originally when this conference was planned for December that there could be literal overlap. And yes. unfortunately, a democracy summit sort of slightly got in the way of that. But anyway, we'll, we'll, pass, we'll pass over that. Mary, there's a lot on the plate for the Media Freedom Coalition. There's diplomacy, there's uh, the legal aspects, there's the regulatory aspects. Should they also be shaking the tin and, and, and working together on the funding part too? And how best could they do that? What did your research tell you? Well, to be honest, we didn't really um, give any specific recommendations about how they should raise money and how they should spend it, really. Um, we've left that up to 
perhaps other initiatives that we know are going on um, uh, to lobby donors, to lobby the core states. Um, I mean, we thank you, Jan, for pointing to recommendation three, which is basically we believe that at least one of the following actions should be a requirement for retaining membership of the MFC, one of, one of which could be um, donating to the UNESCO Global Media Defence Fund, um, but others could be National Action Plan for Safety of Journalists, doing a NAP, each, each country could, should do that really, um, signing a better, a more, a higher proportion of the uh, joint statements and so on. Um, those are all concrete actions which are, I would say, just as valid as giving money. Um, I think, yeah, so we haven't, we haven't given any specific recommendations about how much money to give or how to give it. But, I mean, I know from 25 years in this sector that there's always more money needed, definitely. And there's discussions later this evening and going into tomorrow about how people could spend the more money that we're encouraging you to spend. And I know there will be no shortages of demands on uh, Canada and your peers and the Media Freedom Coalition. So let's move into the final section. We're nearly there, folks. You've been very patient. Thank you very much. Um, what next for the Media Freedom Coalition? How can the Media Freedom Coalition better shine a spotlight and defend against attacks on media freedom? How can it raise the profile of the Media Freedom Coalition work? How can it integrate into the very many other initiatives that there are uh, to promote and defend media freedom? And how can it support media development? Um, I'm very pleased that we have with us uh, remotely, I think, I'm hoping, uh, Martin Scott, Senior Lecturer in Media and International Development at the University of East Anglia, who is part of the academic evaluation team, who's going to talk through some of the recommendations. And we're very sorry you're not here in person, Martin, but um, hello, welcome. Hi there, thanks so much. Uh, yeah, I, I wish I was there. I caught COVID a couple of days ago, uh, so I um, can't join you. So um, what, I, what I wanted to do was kind of, uh, I think a lot of the issues have been um, discussed already. So perhaps I can serve a summarizing role and then a, a summary of some of our key recommendations to, to lead into the final discussion. I guess, and to start that, I thought I might just characterize again what we see as the value of the Media Freedom Coalition. It has a whole load of different strands, but I think our overall view is it's it's achieved a lot simply by being created it's chosen the right issue at the right time at the highest political level at a relatively large critical mass uh, of supportive states so while we're having this panel right now opposite us parallel to us 50 foreign ministers are all recommitting their uh, support for media freedom in different ways and they're all pledging different things and in doing so they're also uh, kind of reinforcing this norm setting role and that's really important that is a huge achievement which wasn't happening three years ago if you'd said to us three years uh, three years ago 50 governments are all going to agree of the importance of media freedom every year at ministerial level, that would be a huge achievement. In addition, uh, there's in various ways, they're also uh, performing the right roles. Uh, one of them is these statements. Now, we have lots of criticisms of their statements, but the fact that uh, um, 20, 30 states each time are signing quite strongly worded collective statements about other states, about the issue of media freedom, is a big achievement that wasn't happening uh, just two or three years ago. Uh, many civil society organisations were calling for exactly that, and that is what the Media Freedom Coalition is now doing. Uh, also diplomatically, the high level legal panel has got a, a whole series of very clear measures and, as we've just heard, bespoke measures that you can use to support uh, media freedom domestically. Uh, this working group and the other, the other initiatives we've heard about at this conference all give very clear uh, ways of ramping up direct support, funding for media, uh, media support. So the creation of the Media Freedom Coalition, its size and its high political level is, is um, to be celebrated. 
However, uh, we think there are there are broadly two sets of things missing. One, as we've already heard about, is kind of just the political will to do these things. And so as hopefully you can see the recommendations in front of you. And some of those recommendations relate directly to political will. There's not much more, as you just heard from Jan, the high level legal panel can do uh, 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 anymore. It's, it's kind of waiting for this uh, support from Media Freedom Coalition states to engage with it, to um, uh, work with it to, to deliver these recommendations and to change, uh, uh, to, to implement it, 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 the policies that it's, it's suggesting. So part of it is it about um, political will to do these things. And that's, that's recommendation two on the high level legal panel. And that's recommendation uh, uh, five on rebalancing this uh, diplomacy heavy grant light approach. Ika talked about funding of £10,000, uh, which is which, it, which doesn't match the, the kind of diplomacy emphasis given uh, by the Media Freedom Coalition. So some of this, some of the improvements, some of our recommendations depend on purely political will. But there are a whole series of other recommendations, which is about how the Media Freedom Coalition works, which could be, which we think would be more easy to deliver. One of them you've, you've heard several times already is to clarify and make more transparent the, the logics used for deciding which countries and issues and situations public statements are written about. Why is it that we've got uh, three statements about China and Hong Kong, uh, two statements about Russia, uh, uh, two sta three statements about Belarus, and two statements about Myanmar? Why are so many statements about those situations and not the US or Sudan or Afghanistan or India or Israel, as we, we've heard different examples today. Why? What's what's the rationale and what's what's the logic for that? Um, uh, 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 that that's the first thought about the joint statements. Secondly, um, even when you make these joint statements, uh, uh, the, the publicity for them has been poor. One thing we haven't really talked about is just just how poor the publicity for these statements have been. Um, uh, just this week, the Media Freedom Coalition has released two statements. One of them was about Hong Kong. Uh, the statement wasn't published on the Media Freedom Coalition's website until two days later. That statement also wasn't tweeted about directly by the social media account of the Media Freedom Coalition. All it did two days later was retweet a tweet put out by the Public Media Alliance. That was it. That was it. That appears to be, as far as I can make out, the promotional strategy for a quite strong statement about media freedom issues in Hong Kong is not matched by the level of publicity for it. And another example, the second statement earlier this week was on um, Myanmar. Um, that statement uh, was uh, published three days after the anniversary, uh, the one year anniversary of the uh, military coup in Myanmar. Um, that seems like a, a, a quite a simple missed opportunity to publish the statement on the day of the anniversary, making it much easier to generate media coverage about it. It's a relatively simple step. Uh, that leads me on to my next point. Uh, that statement about Myanmar was signed by less states than the first statement about Myanmar, um, maybe about a year ago. And so there's another question about the process of getting states to sign it. Um, having a strongly worded statement is important, getting people to see it's important, but getting enough states to support it, it also matters if the Media Freedom Coalition is going to be having this norm setting role. Um, uh, and so, and that brings us on to strengthening the minimum requirements of membership, which is what uh, Mary was talking about a minute ago. Uh, some members are, are, are signing very few statements. In our report, for example, it's uh, Belize and Spain uh, both signed, uh, I think, 28% of eligible statements. And that, that, that if you're going to join an interstate coalition, uh, signing just over a quarter of statements doesn't, doesn't seem enough. So strengthening the minimum requirements, either in terms of the amount of statements you sign or in terms of support for the um, UNESCO uh, uh, Global Media Defence Fund, only 28% of members of the Media Freedom Coalition have contributed any money to the Global Media Defence Fund. So there really is a, a huge difference between this diplomacy heavy grant light approach at the moment. It's very encouraging that that there's a, a, a wise was optimistic that this will be rebalancing. And that's one of our recommendations. The final one I want to end on um, uh, was was another relatively easy one. Some of these depend on political will, and some of these are about the workings of the coalition. Uh, 
our final recommendation is about clarifying the theory of change for the Media Freedom Coalition. How does it expect to bring about change? That's never been clarified. It has some high level objectives. It wants to defend media freedom, shine a spotlight, hold people accountable, raise the diplomatic price for violating media freedom, some laudable objectives. It has some activities, but exactly how those activities contribute to its outcomes is not clear. We were second guessing it in the writing of the report and making that pathway clear should make the activities of the Media Freedom Coalition much more effective. So how, which, which statements which situations of concern do you choose to write statements about? How many? How often? Supported by who? Publicised where? In correspondence with what, what actions through embassies? Uh, 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 in, in correspondence with what kinds of uh, financial support? A theory of change, which hopefully the new secretariat that the Media Freedom Coalition now has, can help produce uh, to kind of make its work more effective. There's a lot being talked about in this conference and on this panel about making sure that that any increase in funding is spent effectively to support media development, and that's that's exactly right. But let's have the same conversation about this uh, uh, about diplomacy. How can diplomacy done be done more effectively? Uh, be done more effectively. And the final observation I'd make about that, just reflecting on on some of the contributions we've had, is that the Media Freedom Coalition has this big umbrella title of defending media freedom, but. What was striking from some of the contributions is the very broad, wide range of different issues that that contains, from uh, military coups in some countries to uh, uh, um, uh, copyright issues, to slaps, to um, uh, financial issues uh, uh, in the Philippines, in Afghanistan, in Sudan, in the US, in India, in Pakistan. The range of the range of issues of of related to an enabling environment that undermines media freedom is broad. Therefore, if the Media Freedom Coalition is to effectively support media freedom in all its forms, then we need to celebrate and embrace the diversity of experiences inside the coalition. We need to know that what's happening in Sudan is very different to what's happening in the Philippines. Um, there is some diversity inside the coalition. Costa Rica, Afghanistan, Japan, Lebanon, um, you know, Germany. We have a wide range of countries in the coalition. And so uh, I guess my final point about clarifying the theory of change would be making best use of that diversity to properly understand how diplomacy alongside increases in funding can, uh, can genuinely support media freedom. Uh, I worry that kind of gets lost sometimes in these big statements that simply defend media freedom when the, the issue is so diverse. Uh, Martin, that, that was, was my... brilliant. Thank you so much. And you've injected some, some huge amounts of energy for our, last, for our last 20 minutes or so. Um, Jeffrey, I'm going to ask you to respond to that vision of the next stage for the Media Freedom Coalition. Okay, well, that, uh, that was great. This has been an amazing discussion. So, you know, thank you again for, I mean, for the report and, and for the panel. I think this has been, uh, this has been brilliant. Um, and it's a bit, you know, listening to Martin there, it's a bit daunting given the diversity of the issues that we're talking about, you know, focusing on, um, protecting journalists and looking at media sustainability and they're all interrelated but it, it really is uh, daunting but I, I'm very optimistic about the year uh, that we have uh, ahead of us but uh, but beyond that so I, I mean as I said before the Media Freedom Coalition is a is a young body it's two and a half years old it's more flexible than a multilateral mechanism but I think, as we've heard from many of the interveners today, um, many would like to see it be a little bit more nimble and a little bit quick. I mean, we're always uh, have a challenge now that the larger we grow, um, the more challenging it can be to be nimble. But I, I, I think there's reason uh, for optimism. Uh, one of the strengths is that we're not um, just a, a, a group of states. We are a, a multi-stakeholder ecosystem. 
and um, you know everyone uh, plays a, a different part in advancing a shared objective. So the consultative network uh, plays its role. One of the big things is, is helping us focus on specific cases and specific countries of uh, concern. Uh, the high-level panel of legal experts um, has the thematic reports and makes, has made many broad recommendations, but really is there as a, as a mechanism and, and a tool to help states, both members and non-members, meet whatever challenges they have in uh, uh, expanding media freedom or getting rid of obstacles uh, to media um, freedom. Um, we have UNESCO, um, which is a, a great partner. I mean, not only a partner I, um, in terms of management of the Global Media Defense Fund, but um, we've seen them in terms of uh, uh, the Diplomatic Networks Initiative that on the ground for our, our efforts in, in one particular country, they are serving as the secretariat on the ground to help coordinate uh, MFC members on the ground uh, to engage. And then, of course, we have the, the member states of, uh, of the coalition, which are integral to, to the work we're doing. I see going forward, we're really at a moment where moving forward, it's a, an opportunity to consolidate. You know, we've reached a very good critical mass of, of members, and there have been references to some of the new mechanisms or new reasons for optimism that can help us consolidate. One um, is the website. We now, like, yeah, I mean, it, it, when you can't find um, the state easily, the statements that the Media Freedom Coalition has issued, that is a problem. So now, thanks to the hosts of the conference, Estonia, they have also uh, set up a, a website uh, for us, which is which looks great. I know Martin has given us some suggestions. We maybe can be a bit more nimble. There's a lot going on right now, but I think that is a really important tool that um, speaks to the consolidation that's going on now. We also have a secretariat, thanks to um, the support, uh, you know, a legacy left to us by the United Kingdom, who is been there from the start and is passing, has passed on its uh, co-chair role to the Netherlands. But this secretariat will, um, I, I think, really be an opportunity to help us um, focus on some of the big issues that have been raised now and not have to worry about some of the sometimes tedious administrative aspects that are vital to ensuring coordination, but that um, take away some of the time that's needed to focus on some of the big issues that are raised uh, now. I've spoken about the diploma diplomatic networks and energizing our mission networks on the ground, which is key. I won't go into that uh, little uh, anymore. Um, uh, we've revised, as I said, our terms of reference, which will help us be more deliberate um, with, with a role for the consultative network in expanding our membership, but will also help us hold ourselves to account as members. And, and you know, Sudan, clearly, we, I mean, I, as there was a reference made, work is going on, but we've got to more to do on uh, Sudan, and I think our new terms of reference will be helpful in Afghanistan uh, as well, but it, it, it's not uh, just there. Um, we have to increase our visibility. Uh, that is key. Uh, the website is part of, it will help us in that, but really, um, I think the Secretariat will be a key mechanism to allow us to increase our uh, visibility to make the, the work that we're doing and that we will continue to do more uh, prominent. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think, you know, going back to something that started out at the beginning with uh, some of uh, Jan's intervention, that we have real opportunities to energize uh, our states going forward in terms of dialogues with all the partners, with, with the panel, the legal panel, with the consultative network, and uh, with uh, UNESCO. So I'm very optimistic about uh, the year going forward, and I've, I've sensed that, I mean, I, I've sensed that from everybody on the stage. And yes, we've got a lot of areas to work on, but I think we're helping to bring consolidation and increasing our means to collectively this ecosystem that is the Media Freedom Coalition advance on our shared objective. And we appreciate you coming and taking the feedback and hearing the feedback. I think the transparency and the, the willingness to be held accountable is really important, so thank you. I'm going to ask our other panelists one minute. Where do you see, what, what role do you see from the Media Freedom Coalition in supporting and defending media freedom and sustainability going forward? Jan. Action. Action, excellent, that's fine, right, we can go on, a vase. Same, I would say, <laughs> uh, uh, going forward, work on accountability, 
uh, improve uh, diversity. Uh, the positive things that are as the diplomatic network, it is connecting embassies uh, with, with the local stakeholders, that's great. And the other thing is the working group on, on media safety. Thank you. And Mary? Yeah, reset, if you want one word, and then just continue being accountable to evaluators like us uh, in the future, you know. Really good. Thank you. I'm now going to invite Ambassador Dr. Bahia Tazib, Human Rights Ambassador of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, to come and speak. While she's coming up, if you give our panelists a big hand. And we... I, un I understand our host would like us to leave the stage. So, Ambassador, you can have the stage to yourself. So, oh, wow. So we shall leave the stage. But please give a, a round of applause for our panelists while they, while they exit. So um, good afternoon, or almost good, good evening. Um, it's really a great honor and pleasure to um, be invited to deliver the closing remarks. It was truly a very inspiring, useful, energetic, and empowering uh, event. So thank you very much to the, the panel and the organizers. As the new incoming Media Freedom Coalition's co-chair, I can say that the Netherlands is very grateful for today's evaluation of um, the coalition's important work. Um, thank you all for your excellent recommendations made by the panel and the independent evaluation report to continue strengthening um, the effectiveness, the visibility, added value of the coalition moving forward. That's, that's really important because we all want a strong, effective, sustainable coalition. And we will definitely study with very great interest and attention um, the just released evaluation report reset required. All these ideas and insights help us in our efforts to effectively strengthen the activities of the Media Freedom Coalition and achieve concrete, sustainable results in support of media freedom. A big thank you, of course, to Internet Europe, Inter sorry, Internews Europe, the Foreign Policy Center, and the academic uh, team for organizing this event. And I also would like to very warmly welcome the um, um, yeah, inspiring and also challenging panelists and intervening speakers for all their extremely valuable insights. The Netherlands, um, like the other co-chair Canada, we are very firm supporters of freedom of expressions, both online and offline, at home and around the world. Why? Freedom of the press is fundamental to a free, inclusive, and informed society and must be protected. But then when we look around the world, we see it, the decline in media freedom, and that makes it all the more necessary for countries to stand up, to take a lead and take a stand for a free press. So the Netherlands is, first of all, very grateful to uh, the UK and Canada for initiating the Media Freedom Coalition three years ago. And this coalition, um, uh, it's still in its infancy phase, of course, um, has still enabled us to do more together to support media freedom in all parts of the world and the safety and security of journalists. And that is not always easy, as we very clearly heard today. But raising our voices together is clearly more powerful and effective than making individual statements. It puts us in a stronger position, potentially, to take effective action or to be able to take effective action and have impact. That is why 50 countries in, in a span of just less than three years have decided to join and invest in the Media Freedom Coalition, some more than others. But also the good news that soon, hopefully, we'll have two new uh, active members uh, joining the Media Freedom Coalition. Now the context. Around the world, we are seeing journalists are being attacked, imprisoned, and even killed by people who want wrongdoing to remain covered up, stories to go unpublished, and secrets to remain buried. That's why yeah, journalists are being silenced and why authoritarian regimes are continuing tightening their grip on the media. And um, as I did in another session, I want to briefly highlight two concrete uh, threats to media freedom that are particularly um, significant in light of the global pandemic and the global democratic recession. First, many media outlets are under immense financial pressure, particularly their advertising revenues are vanishing and their old business models are collapsing. And as a result, many news, new uh, news outlets are becoming more vulnerable 
to either bankruptcy or power seeking to undermine reliable and independent news. And this is really clearly an, um, an immediate threat to the survival of free and independent media to which we have to pay close attention. Second, the pandemic has magnified the risk many uh, journalists and media uh, staff face both online and offline. They are increasingly subject to physical and verbal violence, threats, intimidation, lawsuits, and imprisonment. In the past five years, UNESCO has recorded 400 killings of journalists worldwide. That's 400 people too much or too many. It has also reported that almost 90% of the perpetrators go unpunished. So nine out of 10, that's really amazing. And what happens is, is that the climate of impunity perpetrates the cycle of violence against journalists and the media. And it's particularly alarming, I would like to also emphasize, that women journalists are disproportionately threatened and harassed online. Almost 75% of all women journalists worldwide have faced multiple forms of discrimination, often, in, often intersecting with sexual orientation, race, religion, ethnicity, or gender identity. And this escalation of gender-based um, online violence and harassment is of urgent concern and a serious threat to an inclusive and independent media landscape. So I heard very clearly what the panel and, and the speakers were saying. It is also very important that we critically evaluate and review our media freedom in our own countries. That makes our actions and messaging in the wider world coherent and more credible. It shows that we demand a lot of ourselves, just as we have high expectations of other countries. I can say that in my country, the Netherlands, violence against journalists is, alas, unfortunately increasing, even though we are very high up uh, the ranking uh, of reporters without frontiers. Um, last year, I would like to emphasize this, the Netherlands was really shocked by the murder of the Dutch crime journalist Peter R. de Vries in broad daylight in Amsterdam, something we just couldn't imagine it, it happened. And we really lost a meticulous and dedicated seeker of justice and truth. And something fundamental was changed in my country, our free press, the right to record, write and communicate without fear. And this harsh reality has only increased our dedication to improve the safety of journalists in the Netherlands and around the world. As the coalition's new co-chair, we will be intensifying, together with uh, Canada, the other co-chair, our close cooperation with the consultative network, which is a very important voice of civil society, the high-level panel of experts, and the 50 coalition members. We'll particularly aim to prevent attacks, protect journalists and media workers, especially women, and prosecute offenders. And we will be focusing on these three Ps, both within and outside the Media Freedom Coalition, so prevent, protect, and, and prosecute. And we will especially push for more accountability for crimes against journalists, because in the end, accountability is the ultimate form of prevention. In light of today's session, I would like to emphasize the important opportunity of learning and improving through the independent evaluation of the Media Freedom Coalition and also this panel. Their findings demonstrate that we can do more and achieve more together. But we have to be focused, have a strategy, learn from, from guidance given to us. And I think that is really good news. And we are very grateful for the recommendations made to increase the coalition's effectiveness and added value and what was also said, visibility. And what I also really um, appreciate is that the recommendations made are very much in line with the focus and priorities of the co-chairs. As co-chair, the Netherlands will, like the UK and Canada, commit to, an ad to advance an effective and sustainable coalition. We, we will particularly aim to strengthen the coalition's diplomatic and advocacy activities and make full use of the diplomatic tools at hand to address cases of journalists in need. We also very much welcome the advice of the consultative network and the high-level panel of legal experts in these matters, and we will seek to continue intensifying our collaboration with them. Ladies and gentlemen, in closing, this 
extremely inspiring and energetic session has provided so much useful guidance um, on how we can work more closely and effectively together to make the difference that we are really seeking to make. We must all stand strong and credible, keep on doing better in all fields, and move forward energetically. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was really good.